We live in a day where Ahithophel hanging himself, or as you saw, Judas hung himself, or as we see Saul assisted suicide. We live in a day where suicide is now pretty common. It's normal. The Bible talks about suicide. We see that Judas committed suicide. Why? Because it was as if the devil drove him to it. Remember, it says that the devil was responsible for his actions. And, and there's this evil force. Even if you're listening, like, I'm not part of purple spiral dynamics or blue. Can I just remind you that there is an evil force, psycho-spiritual transrational forces playing on the battlefield of our neurobiochemistry. And sometimes there is a, an attack that can come, whether chemical or spiritual, a mixture of both, I believe, can drive people to suicide. You look at somebody like Saul, who was so hopeless that he asked an Amalekite to commit euthanasia to help give him assisted suicide. Saul wanted to die and actually committed sort of a vicarious suicide euthanasia to get put out of his ministry. But in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23, we see another character who became so hopeless that he committed suicide. His name is Ahithophel. And Ahithophel was a counselor to King Absalom when he was trying to wrest the throne from his father, David. Through Machiavellian on steroids tactics, even though Machiavelli was actually a pretty good guy, his, the name, the phrase Machiavellian is very misunderstood. I read The Prince by Machiavelli. He, was, he actually didn't always take his own advice. He was very actually selfless and was loyal. So it's really interesting how history can taint things to what they really weren't because history is subjective. But, but, but Absalom was all about resting the throne, doing a coup from his father, taking his dad's crown. And Absalom, he was a handsome guy, but he was a handsome devil. Can I get an amen? He was a handsome devil. He was a handsome guy, but he was not a good guy. And so Ahithophel was counseling him, but there was another advisor. There was somebody else in the cabinet. There was somebody else walking through the proverbial oval who was giving counsel and advice, and his name was Hushai. And Absalom started listening to Hushai rather than listening to Ahithophel. And so as there's this civil war between Absalom and his dad, and, 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 and Ahithophel is giving advice to Absalom, but Absalom's not listening to him. Absalom's listening to Hushai. When, Abs when Ahithophel realizes my counsel and advice, my whole identity is wrapped up in this whole counseling business and my job, and now that my job is meaningless and at risk, there's no point in living anymore. So this is what happened in 2 Samuel. Let's go back here because this is super important to 2 Samuel 17, verse 23. And when Ahithophel, read this with me, 2 uh, Samuel 17, 23. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed or was not done, he saddled his donkey and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order. As your margin might say, gave charge concerning his house. This was not something that he did in a wild, spurious moment. This was something that was thought out. He put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Somebody just told me of an elementary school kid who hanged himself. I was speaking in New Mexico a little, uh, uh, like maybe a month, month or two ago, and this six-year-old came up to me and said he was suicidal. We live in a day where Ahithophel hanging himself or as you saw, Judas hung himself, or as we see, Saul assisted suicide. We live in a day where suicide is now pretty common. It's normal. And people ask, is suicide something that is genetic? Or is suicide something that is entirely of my own responsibility? Like, like what is this thing? Is suicide something that, that is passed down to me through my DNA genome and spiral ladder? Or is suicide something that that I can control. Well, here's a phrase that I think is really interesting. Genetics load the gun, actions pull the trigger. Genetics load the gun, but actions pull the trigger. There's this really interesting dance in the Bible between generational curses and personal responsibility. 
So for example, in the Old Testament, in Exodus 34, verse 6 through 7, this is one of the most quoted, this is actually the number one most quoted passage in the Bible by the Bible. What John 3, 16 is to us, to Jewish consciousness, it was Exodus 34, 6 through 7. And that's where it says God is merciful. Uh, the language there implies a womb. God has the motherly affection, as it were, the womb. He talks about being slow to anger. In Hebrew, it means long-nosed because in Jewish consciousness, if your nostrils flared kind of like bulls with a conquistador, that meant you were angry. And if your nose got red, that meant you were angry. So the longer the nose, the longer it took you to get angry. So when it says God is long-nosed in Hebrew, it means he's slow to get angry. It takes a really long time for him to get mad. It says that he's gracious. Approximately 13 times we see in the Old Testament the word grace or gracious being gracious being used. It's not just a New Testament idea. All these descriptions of God. But then, and I didn't get to cover this a couple of Sundays ago when I taught it. I think, I wonder if some people were like, oh, he skipped verse 7. The next verse, God says, and I will surely visit the sins of the, ch of the parents on their children. People are like, wait a second. So what the parents do wrong is going to affect the kids? But then in another passage, in Ezekiel, God says, don't say my teeth are set on edge because my father's ate sour grapes, which was a proverbial way of saying, God, God was telling them, don't say I'm the way I am. I'm bitter because my parents ate sour grapes. That's too Freudian. That's not taking personal responsibility. And then in, in another passage in the Old Testament, God says, I will not visit the sins of the parents on their children. So which is it? Does the sins of the parents affect the children? Or do the children have a personal responsibility to get out of the bad habits of their parents? What is the answer? Lee, you've been here too many times. You know the answer, my friend. What is the answer? Both. See, this is how I interpret it. And you can disagree with me hermeneutically, but this is how I understand it with my hope yoke hermeneutic. I believe God was saying, this is a biological fact that 50% of your DNA genome spiral from your dad and another percent from your mom go to you. In other words, there are biological components to depression and modern day science is showing us that. We harbor it in our bones. If you have a history of family depression. On the other hand, neuroplasticity is now teaching us that you can change the grooves in your brain because uh, my counselor friend put it this way, I love this, that your, your brain, the, the grooves in your brain are like the grooves on the bank of a river and your stream of consciousness is like the stream or the river. And where the stream of consciousness goes, where the river goes, that's what's forming grooves in your brain. So neuroplasticity, modern science tells us through muscle memory, what we habitually and repeatedly think about is what shapes our brain. That's why you want to get in the right habits. So which is it? Can we form new habits or are we stuck or are we affected by our parents or our grandparents or our great grandparents habits? The answer is yes, there is a biological component to depression, but there is also freedom and responsibility to not blame previous generations, grandparents, great grandparents, mom's side, dad's, whatever. You, you weren't supposed to blame. Why? Because there is a biological component, but also God says, hey, I'm not going to punish the kids for what the parents did. Are you tracking with me? So genetics load the gun, but actions pull the trigger. Do you get what I'm saying? You don't have to pull the trigger. That was a metaphor, but it's also literal. Ben Corson here. Thank you so much for watching my new YouTube channel. Make sure to smash that like and subscribe button. Share this video with all your friends and hit that bell so you're notified every time a new video comes out. May the hope be with you.